As I mentioned, you may see on your request slip for temporal bone imaging, COM versus cholesteatoma. The COM referring to chronic otitis media and cholesteatoma referring to that ingrowth of squamous epithelium that occurs in the middle ear cavity that can lead to a lot of different complications, which we'll see in, in just a moment. The typical explanation for the occurrence of a cholesteatoma is that there is a defect that occurs in the tympanic membrane, which allows that squamous epithelium from the external auditory canal to grow into the middle ear cavity. And the portion of the tympanic membrane that is usually affected is the pars flaccida. The pars flaccida is the larger, more superior portion of the tympanic membrane. The inferior and posterior portion is called the pars tensa. And it's said that 80% of cholesteatomas occur due to the ingrowth through the pars flaccida. From the pars flaccida ingrowth, the cholesteatoma will show soft tissue opacification in Prusak space. Remember that Prusak space is the space between the scutum and the middle ear ossicles. And along the way, that scutum may be either blunted or eroded. The complications of cholesteatoma include fistulae to various structures. You can have a fistula to the seventh cranial nerve. You can have a fistula to the semicircular canals. You can even have a fistula to the vascular structures. So this is one of the dangerous complications, obviously, of a cholesteatoma. Cholesteatomas will also erode bone. The most common sites of bony erosion are the tegmen tympani, that is the roof of the temporal bone, the ossicular chain, and typically we see the incus and malleus affected more commonly than the stapes. It can affect the wall of the seventh cranial nerve, particularly along its tympanic portion, and as I mentioned, it may erode the sputum. The seventh cranial nerve involvement is problematic because cholesteatomas can lead to facial nerve palsy, and that is a complication that obviously is uh, cosmetic as well as functional with regard to the muscles of facial expression. Cholesteatomas are seen otoscopically as a white pearl, and this is not to be confused with the black pearl of um, Pirates of the Caribbean. So the white pearl is a pearly white uh, soft tissue that is seen deep to the tympanic membrane. This is going to be distinguished from the red retrotympanic lesion, which are the vascular lesions and glomus tumors, which we'll talk about in a moment. So there are two different theories about the cholesteatoma's etiology. One is the invagination theory, which says that chronic eustachian tube dysfunction produces a vacuum phenomenon within the middle ear and leading to retraction pocket of the pars flaccida and then the lining of the epithelium of the tympanic membrane or external auditory canal grows through and in this retraction pocket which extends to the Prusak space. The epithelial invasion theory postulates ingrowth of keratinized squamous epithelium due to a perforation of the tympanic membrane. So one postulate is that the problem is in the middle ear and the vacuum phenomenon, the eustachian tube dysfunction. The other is a theory that occurs from external auditory canal or tympanic membrane with squamous ingrowth. In any case, what we typically see is opacification of middle ear structures, erosion of middle ear structures, and then, as you see here in the anterior epitympanic space, you have loss of the bony confines. And in this example, we see that the cholesteatoma is fistulizing to the lateral semicircular canal anterior cruce. So this is an example of a perilymphatic fistula of a cholesteatoma in the anterior epitympanic space to the semicircular canals. Here is a diagrammatic uh, example where we see the 
ingrowing squamous epithelium initially on the tympanic membrane and then infiltrating Prusak space. Remember, this is the malleus, this would be the scutum, and this is Prusak space and the epitympanic space above. So this would be sort of the ingrowth theory of cholesteatoma development. Once it's here, it may lead to erosion of these middle ear ossicles, both the malleus and the incus. As you can see, the stapes is a little bit further away and is less likely to be affected. This is affecting the anterior superior portion of the tympanic membrane, which is the pars flaccida. This is the more posterior inferior portion of the tympanic membrane, the pars tensa. So in this example on the CT scan, we can see that the Scutum has been blunted and eroded. There's soft tissue around the middle ear ossicles, in this case, the incus, and you see soft tissue extending to the tegmen tympani here and eroding the tegmen tympani. Not only that, but the facial nerve canal, which should be right here, its undersurface has also been eroded by this cholesteatoma. Another example. Scutum, Prusak space, no middle ear ossicles identified. The facial nerve canal is possibly involved as well. Another case, blunted scutum, portions of middle ear ossicle. Here's incus with erosion of the long process of the incus. We got a little bit of the articular process of the long process of the incus with soft tissue in the middle ear cavity. One of the phenomena that cholesteatoma can do is something called an automastoidectomy. That is that it can erode the bone sufficiently in the mastoid air cells as well as the middle ear cavity that looks as if the patient has had post-surgical mastoidectomy cavity with a canal wall down uh, mastoidectomy. This patient's not had any surgery. It's the soft tissue cholesteatoma that's eroded all of the ossicles as well as the middle, the mastoid air cell septations. And here you can see one about to do the same. Again, this is cholesteatoma eroding portions of the mastoid and also no middle ear ossicles. So the so-called automastoidectomy of a cholesteatoma.